chemical reaction. What is a chemical reaction? A chemical reaction is when substances are combined with other substances in order to create a whole new substance. For example, salt is a product of a chemical reaction. Let's start at the beginning with matter. Everything that exists in the world is considered matter. What is matter? Matter is made out of tiny particles called atoms and molecules. Everything that we touch, eat, and even the air around us is matter. Everything that exists, occupies space, and has some sort of mass is considered to be matter. Mass is how much matter something contains. Now let's talk about the properties of matter, because it is very important in how we understand chemical reactions. There are many properties of matter. Let us cover some of them. Mass and Volume Mass is measured in grams or kilograms. Volume is how much space an object takes up. Volume can be measured in millimeters, liters, or cubic meters. Temperature and pressure. When an object is at a higher temperature, it means that the particles inside of the atom are moving at a higher speed. Temperature can be measured in degrees Celsius, degrees Fahrenheit, and Kelvin. Pressure refers to the force that is applied upon an object's area. Force can be a push or pull in one direction. Pressure can be measured in pascals or kilopascals. Density Density relates mass to volume. Density compares how much space an object can take up. Density compares how much space an object takes up to the amount of matter in the object. In other words, density is the amount of mass per unit of volume. The formula for densities is as follows. Density equals mass over volume. Density is measured in kilograms per cubic meters. States of matter is also very important. Think of solids, liquids, and gas states, and how they change into each other. The process of when a solid state changes to a liquid state is called melting. A solid is usually heated to start the melting process. The temperature at which a solid changes to a liquid is called the melting point. The process of changing a liquid state to a solid state is called freezing. The liquid is freeze to start the process of freezing. The temperature at which a liquid changes to a solid is called the freezing point. The process of a solid changing to a gas is called sublimation. An example of sublimation is when dry ice melts and turns into gas vapors. The process of changing from a gas state to a solid state is called deposition. We often see this in the form of frost when water vapor turns into frost because of the cold weather. The process of changing from a liquid state to a gaseous state is called evaporation. The liquid is usually heated or exposed to warm temperatures to start the evaporation process. Another thing that we need to know before we get into chemical reactions is atoms. What are atoms? Atoms are the smallest unit of matter. Inside an atom, there are three types of particles called electrons, protons, and neutrons. If you recall, electrons are negatively charged while protons are positively charged. Neutrons have neutral charge. Opposite charges are attracted to each other. Therefore, electrons are attracted to protons. Electrons repel one another. When two atoms combine together, they form a molecule. Even our human body is made out of molecules. Okay, let us move on to elements. What are elements? There are 118 elements in the world. Scientists create a table to group all 118 elements by similar elements. Periodic table is called periodic since each row in the table is called a period. The sequence of elements is determined by the element's atomic number, which is displayed on the top left of each element. Each element is determined by differences in their atomic structure. The number of neutrons, protons, and electrons are different for each individual element. Each element has an atomic number, which represents the number of protons that the element has. There are different groups of elements, such as noble gases, alkali metals, alkali earth metals, transitional metals, post-transitional metals, metalloids, halogens, lanthanides, and antonides.
Each element has abbreviation using letters, such as nitrogen being represented by the letter N. A periodic table is used by many people even today to determine what type of group each element belongs to and to predict its properties. As we learned in the lesson before, electrons travel around the nucleus in orbits. The orbit is thought to be a shell around the nucleus. Each shell can contain a specific number of electrons. Valence electrons are said to be the number of electrons in the outermost shell. When the valence electrons of an element are less than 8, it means that they can be drawn into another element and react with them. For example, sodium and chlorine can react with each other because chlorine is missing one valence electron in order to have 8 valence electrons in its outermost shell. They react to form sodium chloride. An example of these types of elements can be found in the last column or column 18 of the periodic table. These elements are called noble gases and already have 8 electrons in their outermost shell, making them very stable and unreactive with other types of elements. For an element, the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. So when we see the anonic number in the periodic table, we can say that the number of protons will be the same. How about compounds? A compound is created when two different types of atoms bond together in order to create a new substance. Similar to sodium and chlorine bonding together using their valence electrons to create the compound of table salt. There are two types of compounds, ionic and covalent. Ionic compounds. The valence electrons in the outermost shell of atoms can bond together. An ionic compound is created when one element donates valence electrons to another element. This way, both elements have enough valence electrons to be stable. An example of an ionic compound is magnesium oxide, which is made out of two elements of magnesium and oxygen. Looking at the anonymic numbers of each of these elements, you can see that magnesium has two electrons in its outermost shell while oxygen has six. This means that oxygen needs two electrons to have an outermost shell with eight electrons. Magnesium donates two electrons to oxygen, making a new ionic compound called magnesium oxide. Covalent compounds. Covalent compound is created when one element shares its electrons with another element. The valence electrons are shared in pairs. An example of a covalent compound is water. The compound of water has two hydrogen atoms and one atom of oxygen. Since we know oxygen needs two valence electrons in its outermost shell, each of these two hydrogen atoms share one electron with the oxygen atom in order to make water. This allows the hydrogen atom to have two electrons in their shell and be stable, and the oxygen atom to have eight electrons in their outermost shell to become stable as well. Now that we know all of the background information, let's finally move on to the understanding of what chemical reactions really are. Chemical reactions are when two or more substances go through a reaction in order to create a new substance. The final product usually has different properties than the substances. The substances used for the reaction are called reactants. So why do we need chemical reactions? We want to make use of the products that come from chemical reactions. Did you know, some candies are created using chemical reactions. Things that we use every day such as paint, salt, and crayons are, are also made with the help of chemical reactions. With chemical reactions, there are different types of changes. Let's go over them. Physical change can be many things. It can be changes in color, changes in state, such as states of matter, changes in shape, changes in texture, how something feels to the touch, changes in physical properties such as mass, volume, or density. Chemical reactions, on the other hand, are what happens to the final product when a chemical reaction takes place. Some of these chemical reactions can be changes in color, presence of an odor or smell, changes in temperature, presence of bubbles, a solid precipitate can also form at the bottom where the liquids are reacting. An example of chemical changes are sour milk, a runny banana, and fireworks. Now that we got all of that out of the way, let's talk about solubility. Solubility refers to a substance's ability to dissolve into a liquid. Dissolving means that the solid completely disappears into the liquid and there are barely any traces of the solid left. 
The thing that we are trying to dissolve is called the solute. The liquid that we are trying to dissolve the solute in is called the solvent. If a substance easily dissolves into a water solvent, it is considered to be soluble. An example of a soluble solid is sugar, where the solvent can be water. The sugar completely dissolves in the water. If a substance does not dissolve into a water solvent, it is considered insoluble. An example of this is when sand is a solute and water is a solvent. The sand does not dissolve into the water. Chemical reactions are all around us, in our science labs, in our kitchens, and even in nature. Chemical reactions are vital to our everyday lives. After all, the air that we breathe is a product of chemical reaction called photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, plants will absorb water, carbon dioxide, and sunlight in order to create glucose and oxygen. Like what you've learned? Be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more future content.